everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to download and have a listen. If you like what we do, please consider giving us a like and a share. And if you love what we do, please consider becoming a patron as it actually does mean a lot to us and helps our work. Uh, this week, we've got a character who I believe you will know who he is. But not only that, I also believe you've probably already got an opinion on him. It's Roger Hallam, co-founder of XR and founder of JSO. Um, for those that have seen Roger interviewed in the past, whether in live or on TV, you'll know that Roger doesn't suffer fools gladly. However, if he sees you as an ally, i.e. an anti-capitalist or someone who genuinely believes in the health and well-being of the planet, he's actually pretty cool. Uh, topics discussed on the show today are farming in relation to the climate crisis, the creation of XR and JSO, the power of popular movements, neoliberalism, citizens' assemblies and revolution. Any feedback you will give to the show, we'd really appreciate hearing about it. Any comments, please give it. Um, and yeah, on with the show. Welcome everyone to the Green New Deal podcast, part of your favourite environmental platform, GND Media. I'm Adam Williams, and today I'm joined by Half Man, Half Mixing Deck, Andrew Glassford. How are you, mate? I'm very well, man. And our guest today, mate, is one of the founders of both Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil. It's Roger Hallam. Thank you so much, Roger, for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks very much. Really appreciate your time. So first question is one that I usually always ask new guests, Roger. Um, and what I'm asking is, when was the first time that climate change was such a big deal for yourself that you decided that actually... I'm going to pretty much dedicate my whole life to it. Well, it you know, it was a bit of a progression like it is for most of us. Yeah. I can't actually remember when I first heard about it. You know, I'm sure lots of people don't, but um, I wasn't a farmer for 20 years. So I I had a, a bunch of extreme weather events that made me focus on the visceral aspects of what's coming down the road. And, um, and then I decided I'd, moved back into academia like I had done in my 20s and yeah I I didn't have a particular point but when we set up Extinction Rebellion it was a lot of a grind for a while and then I think George Monbiot did an article in The Guardian and then Bernie Sanders put it on his Facebook page and I was weeding the spinach at the time and my partner came in and said oh Bernie Sanders just sent it out to seven and a half million people and i was thinking wow oh okay maybe in my days of weeding spinach are over <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's when i went into 70 hour a week mode for the next seven years yeah, yeah. so um people may not may not know that you as a farmer roger so i'm assuming that there was you know some sort of yield or maybe a series of yields where you thought actually there's something not quite right here and you looked into it a little deep and perhaps and uh, started to see the connections, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I've always been involved in the green movement type stuff, you know, since I was a teenager. So it's not like I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. But there's mm -hmm. a big difference, as I'm sure many people know, between, you know, knowing something intellectually and having, you know, st standing in a field with 30,000 leaks that have gone to sludge. Mm. <laughs> it sort of brings home to you that you know we're heading towards mass starvation and of course most people just don't really get that because they don't really know where the food comes from mm. but as someone that's done 30 seasons of growing vegetables yeah you know dare i say it, i can tell your audience we are heading towards mass starvation because you can't grow food you know, when it doesn't rain for 12 weeks or when it does rain for seven weeks or mm. when it's minus 15 in the winter. And those sort of events are coming along, you yeah. know, every two or three years now when they start coming along every year, then you're going to have massive food shortages and all the stuff that comes with that. So for me, like, it's always been a matter of life and death mm. um, because if you're a farmer, you deal with life and death, you create life. You deal with death. Sorry to get really heavy early on. No, let's, let's but, do it. Know, oh, let's do it. it is, that's what. The, yeah. That's what you know. That's what we're talking about here. To call yeah. spade a spade. And yeah. um, and so yeah, spent you know last ten years trying to communicate that to people, and say you've got to get out and do civil resistance, otherwise we're going to be dead. And it's not for the first time in human history people have had to come you know come up against that decision yeah to 
just sit around waiting to die or to get out and fight for what they believe in. So that's where we're at again, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, um, there's obviously a number of issues in regards to the environment and climate climate change is one of them, but there's also a, a depletion in our biodiversity. Now, I read a book a couple of years ago by um, James Rebanks about how he was from a generation, like a new generation of farmers, and he sort of spoke about his father's generation and his grandfather's generation. And just in that short space of time, just how different those farming techniques were and how more destructive they became because it became such a, um, almost like chasing the profit. Did you notice that in your experience as a farmer in regards to farming techniques, either on farms close to yours or what was being promoted around the time you were uh, a full-on farmer? Well, well, I'm not, I'm not a proper farmer in the sense that it's not like my dad was and my granddad, you know, yeah. going back 12 generations on the family farm and all that sort of thing. You know, I got into it because basically I like growing food, you know, mm -hmm. for, it is what it is. You know, I like it. And for me, because I was an organic vegetable grower, the technology side of it were pretty basic. It was, you know, it well, was going against the grain like a lot of organic farming is. But obviously, I'm quite familiar with the way in which farming has become more and more specialised and reliant on in inputs, which are part of a global economy, and farmers feeling more and more out of control of their livelihoods and their future. Not, you know, from two sides, really, obviously, from the climate crisis side with what's happening with the weather, but also being locked into this global economy and the and the massive, the massive corporatization of farming. Yeah. You know, you get your grains from the Amazon, you know, you get tractors from from China. It's not really what they wanted to do, but that's where, you know, it is. We're all locked into this death system, aren't we? Yeah. And um, we bought the farm off, it was bought as a cooperative, we bought the farm off this guy who had been in a farming family, and he was saying, you know, before the war, it was all mixed farming in Carmarthenshire mm -hmm. in Wales. Mm -hmm. It all went over to cows and one man with a load of nitrogen sort of farming. Um, but before the war, you know, there was mixed farming, corn and orchards. And obviously it was a lot more communal then. You know, yeah. it was more of a, a, a community basis. I'm not glamorising because it's a hard life, right? Oh, yeah, well, of course. Yeah, yeah. A significant issues around loneliness and isolation mm -hmm. in modern farming because that's what it's made it. It's one guy and 300 acres and a load of cows, you know. Yeah. And it's not really what they want to do, <laughs> to, to be yeah, honest. I suppose there's that kind of dichotomy between the traditional idea of a farmer being a provider for people versus them now being a source of revenue for the intermediaries and just being kind of, you know, essentially a mine for Asda or, or, or Tesco now, which is a very different kind of positions we're in. And um, well, as we're kind of talking at the moment, you know, there's lots of action being done by farmers in Wales and across uh, France and Germany. Um, we've not really had a chance to kind of get into that on the show yet, but like, do you have any kind of thoughts or feelings about what's going on with those strikes and why they've gotten to this point now? Well, it's very upsetting because... Yeah to be honest with you, because I have, you know, having done farming for 20 odd years, I, I in, instinctively feel sympathetic mm -hmm. to other farmers, you know, because it's my trade. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a hard life, you know, it's mm -hmm. not easy. Um, and, and farmers feel very, like, misunderstood by the general population because the population by at large is just has no idea how important food is because they've never experienced food shortages of any extent yeah and i yeah. think and so we've taken the farming community for granted and we don't understand that food is not an interchangeable good you know yeah. it's not if you run out of computers it's a bit annoying if you run out of food you die it's it's no joke. Yeah, you yeah, see yeah. what I mean? It is, it is. And at the same time, you know, they're drawn into this massive corporate sort of complex. Yeah. Um, 
and then it's like they're addicted to it because that's the only way they can survive is by getting all these inputs and then they're persuaded that you know they shouldn't be changing to a more ecological system of farming and it's not surprising because they're not given the support and not given yeah. the support because of the main theme of what's going on in the 2020s which you know we can talk more about this and i'm sure you know this story right which is the neoliberal regime mm -hmm. is pushing the cost of the transition onto the poor onto the marginalized yeah. onto people that do the essential work of society you know the working class jobs the farming jobs and letting off the rich and the corporate class who have profited and created this existential crisis mm -hmm. in the first place and they try and construct it as oh we're the green guys and the farmers are being obstructive yeah which is total bullshit right you know basically they're covering for the rich and the powerful who need to pay their way at very minimum yeah and, and I, it makes me absolutely furious that they get away with you know pushing the costs of this necessary transition onto onto these groups and then of course these groups are manipulated by the radical right and yeah. move towards fascist parties this is happening all over europe we mm -hmm. saw it coming years ago right this was going to be the main mechanism and the neoliberal uh regimes are facilitating fascist developments because yeah. People don't want to be true. They don't want to be told they have to pay, yeah, for this transition, you know. And I'm presuming that's the main point of your podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you there's know, two uh, things to do, right? We need to transition, otherwise we're totally fucked. Yeah, and, pretty much. And the only way it can be done is by taxing the rich, be blunt. Um, and that's yeah. the message we need to get out there um and there's no point starting getting tricky about farmers there's that no. they're not the problem right it's the system as well far as I, I'm I, I was going to ask so like you know obviously you work with just a pile of extinction rebellion have you done any kind of specific work trying to reach out to farmers through that or is there already those battle lines drawn between there's you? there's a there's been various sort of attempts mm -hmm. or sort of not attempts that's the wrong word but like sort of experiments okay you might yeah. say yeah, yeah. in in how we can bring together the coalition to say yeah we want this green transition but we're not paying for it or we're not paying for it unless the rich pay for it mm -hmm. and you know that's difficult to do because all the money is with the guys who are saying you know ordinary people need to pay so right. but it it we're in the process of thinking jesso and in the radical climate movement more generally of creating a a longer term strategy a 5 to 10 year strategy which which puts stopping fascism at the heart of what we're trying to do because the climate crisis is not it's not like the climate crisis is going to happen and then we all fall dead one day yeah you know i mean i'm 57 and when i was you know younger like you guys so i think all <laughs> younger you know the whole thing was there was going to be a nuclear war and mm. it was that was wham bam we gone right yeah that was a but full the stop. thing about <laughs> the, the thing about the climate crisis is what the climate crisis really means is fascism mm -hmm. you know it means all authoritarianism it means what like what's going on in russia you know because yeah. because you'll get you'll get regimes which will force ordinary people in into destitution in order to protect the regime mm. and this is already happening so what we need to do is build a social coalition which fuses together the ecological and the social and you know that's easy to say and everyone goes oh yeah that's great <laughs> but as i'm sure you know right it's there's a lot of work to be done it's not going to be done this year and yeah. it's going to come through direct action. It's going to come through people's assemblies. It's going to come through door knocking. It's going to come through high, you know, high level cultural actions. There needs to be a whole, like, range of different activities 
in the same way as movements in the past of social change, whether women's movements or the labour movement or the movements for democracy in the 19th century. You know, all the tactics need to come together and there needs to be a mass movement that's saying, Mm -hmm. uh, over our dead bodies, are we going to betray our kids? And yeah, we're going to have the green transition, but it's going to have to be paid for by the elites, not by Mm -hmm. us. Thank you very much. And that's why I'm rearing to go. Yeah, yeah. You know, to go around the country, do my that's banging why you, speech. That's why you're talking to us on a on a Friday night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's a bit sad, isn't it? But <laughs> hey, not as sad. We've been doing it for be. three years, so we can't. Uh, like... Really, all right. No, no, it's it's a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Roger, um, I just want to take you back a little bit. I know you've moved on from XR, but um, I do think it's quite quite interesting that the sort of the transition again from from being a farmer seeing that these yields are, are out of whack and really starting to feel like, actually, I'm going to, going to have to start becoming a almost like a full-time activist. Uh, what was it that... I know the characters that, um, sort of formed XR, but when was that moment when you all said, right, from this moment forth, we're going to do this, this and this, I'm going to create this group, and how was it launched? And then, obviously, I had a, quite a meteoric rise uh, and also, yeah. I'm just wondering as well if you have some reflections on it all these all these years later. So there's a lot in there, but basically, how what was the start of it, Roger? Yeah, <laughs> you know, what was it like when it was really taking off around the world? Because I mean, you you cannot go into any room in the world and and an environmental space and not hear about XR. So it really has, you know, gone around the world a few times. Uh, so what was that like? But also your reflections as well after a few years. Yeah, well, I did five five to six years of research at King's College in London about the psychology of mobilisation, as it's called, and and how you deploy uh, civil civil disobedience within social movements. And the purpose of that, to be blunt, was to work out how to create a mass climate movement, as you might say. Um because I knew that's what needed to happen and what was coming down the road one way or another, right? Because obviously everything was getting worse and worse. Um, So it took, you know, I was involved in a whole bunch of campaigns, social campaigns, stuff with trade unions, uh, you know, uh, rent strikes, this sort of thing. So sort of work out how you get people to do stuff. So that's my day job, (laughs) is working out how to get people to do stuff. You know what I mean? Like, you know, come on, this demonstration. How do you I, get people I, I to turn think it's up? It's called project management in the uh, yeah, the yeah, world. Sort of, yeah. It's, there's a lot of that. I mean, it's basically applied sales, to be honest with you. That's probably <laughs> me. That's probably blown blown my credibility with part of the audience. But yeah. you know, you know, if you're honest with yourself, whether you're yeah. a socialist or whatever, it's the same sort of. You know, your thoughts going through your head. You know, you want to do something. How do you persuade people yeah. or mm-hmm. bring people into a situation where they're going? What the fuck? I've got to do something, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I worked on all that. And Extinction Rebellion, a lot of people don't know, but, you know, it was in formation, arguably, for about a year and a half. And it was various little prototypical campaigns, which no one knows about now, which mm-hmm. were really rubbish. <laughs> but, you know, because you've got to learn, you know, you've got to learn through failure. I'm yeah, trial and error. Failure, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, you don't you can't overthink stuff. You just need to go out and do it. So a lot of it is based around, you know, networking theory and nonlinear dynamics and these things that are a bit nerdy. Mm-hmm. But um but I, I I presented a paper to this group, you know, which were looking at this in April 2018, I think it was, yeah. Uh in January actually. And they were all going, oh, well, maybe, maybe not, you know. <laughs> so as far as I was concerned, we were going to do it. And if they weren't yeah. going to do it, I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. And by by April of that year, everyone had come round to the idea we were going to do this. And we had big debates over the name and everything. But it was just like 15 people in the room. And then we grind, ground away at it, like getting meetings organised. And mm-hmm. I remember my first meeting in Nottingham and two people turned up. You know, me, one of them was my mate. Yeah. So, you know, but I, I, because I understand how you create social movements, it doesn't bother me that no one shows up. You know, <laughs> I've done lots of things where no one shows up or two people, it doesn't matter. You carry on. Yeah. It's all about persistence and then knowing, you know, but by the autumn, I think 
George Monbiot did this article and then, as I said, Bernie Sanders did this thing. And then we were getting like a thousand likes a day on Facebook or something, you know, and it was mm-hmm. just like whoosh. And 5,000 people came and sat on the bridges in October 2018. And after that, it was cloud nine, you know, because yeah. the whole thing had, 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 you know, it was basically, you know, there's no point pretending we were lucky in that sense. You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. just that we were geniuses or anything stupid like that. <laughs> You know, we we sometimes you hit gold, don't you, yeah. in a campaign, and that was gold times ten. And at the same time, we knew what we were doing, which mm. is why it didn't disappear in three months, right? A lot yeah. of social movements, particularly over the last twenty years, they don't have a structure, they don't have a culture, they have a decision making creation, and we worked all that out because we were studying social movements. So that's why it consolidated itself, and obviously it was great, you know we managed to get it passed with some difficulty that we were going to have 10,000 people in London in April 2019. And that did what it said in the tin, which it yeah. changed history. And it, you know, 200,000 people joined XR, it spread to 70 countries in six months and blah, blah, blah. You know, it was, it was on, it was on the go. Mm. So it was a great, it was a great iteration of, of a, of a movement that was needed at that moment, as you might say. Mm. Um, but I think, four or five years on, um, I think the biggest thing that's changed is, I think around, you know, I think passing 1.5 is going to have a profound effect on our culture, maybe not immediately. Mm -hmm. But basically the neoliberal dream of, you know, create a campaign, get a bit of policy change, and we'll be okay. That's dead with Mm. 1.5. What we're looking at in the what we're looking at now is a different, totally different political landscape where we're going to have massive social conflicts around who pays to to have this green transition. We're going to have massive pushback like we're seeing at the moment, which means we're going to have even more climate change and we're we're in danger of going into this death spiral. And, And that's probably the main scenario. But, you know, what I keep saying to people is, the history is not a deterministic process. It is possible, and it has been possible for people to come together and decide they don't want to die, <laughs> you know, to be blunt. <laughs> and well, and that's important. what I'm saying to people, yeah. is we need to create a movement which has nothing really to do with climate change. Because mm. as I've been saying for a while, like climate change was a phrase made up by corporate PR people to distract people from the criminals to the tool, right? Climate yeah. change isn't the issue. The, the 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 problem is the global elites and capitalism, mm-hmm. and you know it obviously goes deeper than that as well. But in terms of practicality, it's about creating a movement that's primarily social, because yeah. all the ecological stress now manifests itself through the social. Like I, I do quite a lot of work with guys in Italy. And, you know, there's, there was five massive climate disasters in Italy last year, yeah. you know, all within three months, three or four months. I remember, yes, yeah, seeing it. People weren't thinking about climate change. People were thinking, my house is flooded. Yeah. yeah. And corrupt politicians have run off with the money I'm supposed to get as compensation. Yeah. In other words, the climate manifests itself through the corruption of elite, of elite power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's got to be the theme moving forward. Uh, is we're making a coalition to confront elite power, which is bad in and of itself. But at this moment of time, it's totally fucking suicidal, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> fucking nuts. Yeah. It's like these guys, yeah. these guys are, you know, they're death addicts. Yeah. That's what they are. Do you know what, Roger? I, I want to echo a lot of what you said there because I was actually part of the first class of uh, XR in Manchester. And, and I remember the first um, meeting, there was literally eight people there. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah in, right. In a, in a cold, literally, <laughs> eight, in like what? the coldest. Oh, God, that's a bit rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, that, I remember, right, because I be- kind of became climate conscious and I was kind of looking for something. I remember a friend following me and saying, Ads, is this new group, right? You're not going to believe it, right? They're, they're purposely getting arrested for climate change. And straight away, I was going, what? It was like so sort of new and so sort of like exciting to me. I was like, I have to know more about it. So I got involved. And like I said, it was eight people in that first um, classroom in, in, in one of the universities. Um, 
And literally eight months later, there was about a hundred people. You know, it was yeah. it just skyrocketed. It was unbelievable. Now, I also went to the very first four um, actions in in uh, London. The first yeah. one was when the first was when we sat outside Parliament for the first time, and Greta came along and she was tiny and stood behind a mum and all that and dead shy. Um, and then obviously the bridge one was the next one and there was a couple more there. I actually forget which which is in what order, but um, so I kind of did my time in, in XR. And one thing when I look back, one thing that, that I didn't realise at the time, but I think I find quite fascinating now. I didn't know who the leaders of XR were <laughs> until I went to London and somebody said, Oh, that's that's Gail, you know. Um, that's Roger, you know, that they started XR. And it never really occurred to me that I didn't know who the leaders were. And that's almost unheard of, <laughs> I, I'm guessing, in, in movements that people don't know who the figureheads are um, or, or don't for a long time. And, I'm, and when I reflect, I was wondering if it was because at the time the ethos was that sort of Manchester XR is an autonomous group. Yeah, we come up with our own ways of doing things. Yeah, we have a vote. Yeah. We decide what we're going to do, and then we go and do it. And even though we know these other groups around the country that are also XR, and it's kind of like, a, yeah, you know, great, we're just like them. We were very, very much autonomous. And even though I'm not active in XR now, I really appreciated that ethos of, of people just coming together, not really worrying about figureheads, not really worrying about whether other people are going to like what we do or not going to do. If we like what we're going to, if we think about it and talk about it, debate about it and come up with a plan and decide to do that plan, we're just going to fucking do it. And I really, I really yeah. liked that. I thought it was a brilliant way of doing things. And I'm just wondering, was that part of the initial structure when you were setting up X out? Is it just a, a pure coincidence that these, well, these things happened? The thing you, need to understand is there's a lot of thinking went into it right yeah <laughs> it wasn't like uh, yeah, yeah, blah, blah. you know and one of the biggest debates as you may know right in social movements is is the nature of leadership and the degree to which you need leadership and it's complicated right you know i could talk an hour about it if you want but i think one of the fundamentals was this xr was not about leadership egos right we, from the beginning, we had this ethos of what we call service, which is being in service to the movement, right? I don't give a shit about being famous. You know, I, used, I was an organic farmer for 20 years. You know, I never met anyone. I'm not in this so someone can run around trying to get my autograph. It's all embarrassing, basically. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but that said, you need structure and you need organization and, and you need rules. And that's what creates sustainability, right? And those structures and rules have to enable people to feel like they've got uh, autonomy, that they can create their own activism, as you might say. And that's tricky. And it's it always will be tricky because you've got these two different logics, right? You need to be organised and people need to co-create things to feel like they want to participate. So you're constantly messing around with that tension. But broadly speaking, it means you have some you know, the smart design is to have some fundamental rules, like we're nonviolent, we treat each other decently. You know, we have a cent central coordinating groups that coordinate stuff. You don't just tr turn up, da da da. You know, you have trainees. You know, there's a bunch of, of uh, principles that we sort of made up on the back of an envelope. You know, <laughs> but the um, and at the same time, once 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 you follow those rules, then then you can initiate things. Okay. Um, and at the same time, you need to coordinate nationally as well. So you need to have these big events because that's how Mrs. Jones in Bedford comes to hear about you. You know, she sees you on the telly and she goes, oh, my God, that's what I want to do. And she goes on the website. So you can't just have, you know, lots of little campaigns. Those days have gone. Mm. What we need now is what we had before 1989, which is mass movements of ordinary people. And the reason why they had mass movements, you know, in the 20th century is because if they didn't, they were going to get done in in a serious way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the future, is to reinvent like a smart participatory form of, of 20th century mass left movements. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a big opening now. So I'm coming on to something else, but I'll say it. Nice. I think there's a big opening now 
given that Starmer and Labour have disappeared, you know, into the neoliberal, you know, bollocks that we're all pulling yeah. our hair out about. There's a massive opening for something that's post Corbyn in this mm. country, mm. which in which makes a real break from the old top down hard left political party. You know, this is our candidate. This is mm. this is our program. You know, we're we've got the truth. All that sort of old left stuff. Yeah a 21st century left which is genuinely participatory but is a mass movement at the same time and that's where that's my day job is trying to design that and to bring it to scale yeah because as i'm sure you, you know no one needs to be told listening to this right people are really pissed off yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know i mean as i say i'm you know, 57 and i've never known the country so pissed off and like, at the I, moment, all that energy is going nowhere. It's going anywhere. It's going into the Reform Party, you know. Yeah. Because the left isn't organised. And, they're, you know, people are still getting guilt tripped into the idea you've got to vote for Starmer. Well, I, I gave up on that guilt trip 40 years ago. You know, it's mm. like the Labour Party never going to do anything for the ordinary working people in this country and never did. You know, maybe it did in 1945, but it certainly hasn't done it since Blair. So for me, like, that's the big challenge is, is how to create a movement that's a movement and stands in in the election and does direct action and does big cultural events. That's, and that's and doesn't get kind of forward. stuck in the old hard left ways of doing things <laughs> as well, which I suppose is, you know, incipient in a lot of these kind of new things that start up for a bit, like, like the Breakthrough Party was, you know, a collection of all these different things together and then just dissolved because of... Well, I don't really know. Okay, I assume it infighting and lack of organization. So I suppose, yeah, it's like how do you do the new version of that with that with, with a complete break while having probably a lot of the same people that might want to be involved. Well, I can tell <laughs> I can tell you how. Do you want to know how? <laughs> always, always. <laughs> We're going That's... off topic. Sorry, going, oh God, he's going off topic. But no, it's fine. This, this it. is, you know, like I don't want to sort of blow my own trumpet too much, but you know, that's what I do. I do design. Mm. And how on processes to empower people, and I do have a track record with XR and just yeah. and I've done lots of big campaigns around the Western world, and you know the general principle is people need to feel they're involved in order to be involved, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and this is why left parties are generally, you know, the old left parties are unsuccessful because they, as I say, they're very top down. They decide yeah. the program, and then. And then try and get people to vote for them. And obviously that's successful because of first past the post in the UK. So they can get away with it, right? Yeah. But I think, you know, nothing lasts for nothing lasts forever. And um so the upshot of it is, is you know, I've been talking to people in in a bunch of constituencies over the last two weeks, and I'm quite excited because I think the failure of Corbyn has made the left a little bit more humble, no disrespect. You know, because left likes to think, you know, it's the main show, you know, we're socialists and there's a lot going for socialism. And I agree, obviously, but it does it does lead to an inflexibility because people think that they've got the truth. Yeah, it's very, very I mean, defensive, what, isn't it? It's quite defensive and it's not very open to new ideas mm -hmm. for better or worse. And I think because of the disaster that's fallen on the left because of what happened to Corbyn. We don't need to go into the details of it. People are looking for new a new model. And the new model is assemblies. And not, you know, assemblies covers a multitude of sons. They can be done badly. They can be done well. But the model I'm working on <clears throat> is, and this could be done by a bunch of different groups, right? I'm not, I haven't quite worked out which groups should or shouldn't be doing it. But you take a constituency and you have five assemblies and you say, we're going to put a candidate up. We're going to have assemblies in uh, in, 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 in a constituency. Um, because you're actually going to, these, these assemblies are going to choose the candidate mm -hmm. and they're going to choose the programme. So there's a big, there's a big incentive for people to turn up. <clears throat> I mean, where this has been done around the Western world, you can get two or 300 people in the room because it's not yeah. like an assembly that's done you know let's all have a chat and decide the world's a bit of a tricky place and then go home and nothing happens right this is fuck we are going to put a candidate up against yeah. this you know corrupt labor mp who's been in for 30 years and ne never does anything and da 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 right and so you have the assembly everyone you know splits in small groups they decide what's wrong 
They decide what policies they want to see happen, free public transport, you know, mm -hmm. tax the rich, whatever it is. And then they put that together and you aggregate it. It needs a bit of facilitation. You aggregate it. And that's the and that's the um that's the program for that for that constituency. So it might be local issues, obviously. Yeah. And then they choose a candidate in the same way. So instead of, you know, some Oxbridge guy getting swanning in and going, hey, vote for me, it's like, we should put up Mrs. Jones down the road because she's yeah. such a cool person and she spent 40 years helping people in the local community mm -hmm. and she's got a bit of charisma, you see. So then you end up putting a normal person up and, of course, because you've owned that process, then you get hundreds of people doing the door knocking and the leafleting and the stalls, which everyone knows is is what actually what actually enables you to win a constituency mm. so there's variations on the theme and you might think yeah 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 but i'm telling you it could be dynamite right yeah. <laughs> well and, it, it uh, kind of sounds to me like a kind of variation of what they do in cuba so with their kind of um i'm probably talking out my ass here but when they kind of have local candidates in very small areas and everyone's got to put up why they want to do stuff in like the the central part of the neighborhood and they all talk about it and then choose that one person without am i kind of talking out of place with that or is there well i i, I couldn't comment on cube because i'm not like you know but that's the principle right and sort of what you might call intelligent left thinking around the world mm -hmm. has moved towards an assembly model uh, particularly in south america and uh mm -hmm. and that's why the left has been successful in south america because it's left that old marxist model of we've got the true followers otherwise we're going to break your legs sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> you know, that just yeah, doesn't yeah. really turn people yeah, on. Not, not very yeah, enticing. Well, <laughs> it's like, let's all get together, decide what's the problem, put someone up, they're, mm -hmm. they're our person, you see what I mean? And this can get institutionalised, right? You know, so you can have assembly-like movements. Um, and there's loads of pitfalls and blah, blah, blah. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's lots of people listening to it going, oh, well, that, you know, there's a problem with this, problem with that. But what I always say to people is, well, if you've got a better plan, then great. You know, but if your plan is sit Go around fucking do it. <laughs> podcast yeah. waiting to die, yeah. you know, maybe that's not that cool. You see what yeah. I mean? You know, yeah. Roger, what, yeah. Roger, what yeah. I find interesting is uh, when I was in XR, there, there seemed to be a, quite a lack of um, sort of political analysis. Um, and yet to hear you now, it, you know, you very much have ideological you know, uh, views. Um, you've mentioned socialism, you mentioned carbonism, you mentioned Marxism. Um, but th these seem to be quite um, sparse within XR, and it seemed to be purposely so as well. Do you think that was one of the the, the reasons why XR never took off as maybe you'd hoped it would, because it was it was lacking maybe an ideological anchor? Because I know that when I was in it, a lot of us that did leave, we did feel like it was a bit, a bit shallow when it comes to political analysis and talking about neoliberalism, talking about capitalism and having a deep-rooted alternative to capitalism. Those sort of conversations weren't really there. And that's why a lot of us kind of stepped back a little bit. Um, yeah. what's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, these things are complicated, right? So mm -hmm. what I'm going to say is, is obviously going to be a bit overly simplistic. Because, but I think two things happened with XR. First of all, it became very big very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way necessarily, but a lot of people moved into it who had a broad, unideological worldview. You know, it was the liberal middle class of, of the cities. Mm -hmm. And they still had this model that you do a campaign, you win a policy, and then you do a campaign on something else. Yeah. And as I've said, like, now we're in this total crisis. That's a model that doesn't make sense. And I'm not saying I'm against it in principle, right? In mm -hmm. 1995, you know, I was involved in Friends of the Earth, you know, all sort of stuff. You know, it makes sense because society is just trundling along and you're trying to get a few things improved, right? Yeah. But in 2024, we're facing mass death. You know, it is coming. It's here. And on top of that, we've got a ruling class which is totally incapable of doing anything about it, as we see every day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and by that, I mean the Labour Party as well. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing was c COVID. Like, COVID decimated the movement. And mm -hmm. my my personal agenda was that the movement would move towards a more revolutionary social position, right, uh, as it moved along. But it got devastated by COVID, you know, because you couldn't do anything. So when we started Insulate Britain and to a certain extent just the Poil, 
that was not the end point of what we we're trying to do. Right. The the um it was to regalvanize the movement and cheer everyone up, as you might say, and go, hey, you know, civil resistance, this is the way to do it. And we got, yeah. you know, 90% name recognition. And it was, you know, it was functional, but it's not meta functional in the sense that it's not a grand strategy. Right. And what yeah. we're moving towards now is what's called in the trade a grand strategy, a five to 10 year strategy, which necessarily has to be ideological in the sense that it can't replicate the sort of incremental approach of traditional environmentalism, because that's not going to do the job. What's going to do the job is system change. Now, people have been talking about system change, you know, since whenever, mm-hmm. as a sort of, you know, performative, hey, yeah, I mean, system, system change, change, not climate right? change, for example. Yeah, so. it's just like, okay. yeah, yeah, but it doesn't actually mean anything. Yeah. So for us banner. now, what we have to do is concretize that into a strategy which is like credible um, as opposed to sitting around doing nothing. And that strategy, as I see it, just putting it in a personal frame, like mm-hmm. what I think needs to happen is a, is, is a movement that, as I said, stands in elections, does mass demonstrations, does civil resistance, does assemblies, and moves those assemblies to becoming national assemblies, like we've got this idea a few people of this house of the people which basically mm-hmm. um re- replicates and becomes a rival for the house of the commons because in xr if you remember xr we had this idea oh we want a, a people a citizens assembly right on the yeah. climate and it's a great idea you know put, and you, put you got forward. one as well with david Abra came yeah yeah well exactly so what happens is you get a shit one which <laughs> never does anything and they just don't publicize it or they say no so it's really like it's deferential. Well, the more revolutionary approach is to say, we want a national assembly. And if you don't give it us, we're going to do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. And this is the critical moment. You know, This is the main thing I want to communicate nowadays to people is we do it our fucking selves, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're not, but this regime is taking us to our death, right? It's going to kill our kids. It's serious stuff. What we need to do is come together as hundreds of different local assemblies, you know, in Wigan and Manchester and Bolton, right? You have these assemblies and they send people to a national assembly and that national assembly gets some money, you know, it gets some mass movement, everyone's giving their 10 quid and all this business. And then it, when, when Labour win the election in November or whatever, then this national assembly, House of the People, whatever it's going to be called, when Parliament debates childcare, the, the 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 house of the people will debate childcare, and when in parliament they say, "Oh, there's no money," blah blah, then the house of the people will say, "Actually, we do want childcare, and we want to tax the rich properly," and and that will be like an actualization of the people's will, as they say in political mm-hmm. theory. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it won't be just a bunch of people in a pub in Hackney going, "Hey, we should have childcare," right? It will be an ordinary electrician and the nurse will come out onto the steps of that assembly and say this is what the people of Britain want. And they look like the people of Britain and they're speaking for the people of Britain through these assemblies. And that will amplify and build social movements and legitimate social movements. Because when you go on the street as just a point, you know what people say, say, oh, it's just you, you know, yeah. you're being a twat sort of thing. And while if you've got a social movement behind you, which is visibly represented, represents the people of Britain, then you say, actually, this is what the House of the People want. So stuff you. Yeah. And that's basically how radical political change works. You know, if you've, if you've read your Russian Revolution, you know, you've got the Soviets, all this sort of stuff, right? Which doesn't mean, by the way, I'm pro-Russian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. not pro-Lenin, just for the Daily Mail for listening. But <laughs> the but you see what I mean? Yeah. It's it, In terms of the sociology of revolution, how, how societies change, you need to have a street movement and you need to have alternative institutionalization of, of government to, of, of governments. So it's in that direction, and probably loads of people think, oh yeah, this is really naff. But that's what we're that's where we're moving towards. And of course, loads of people before Extinction Rebellion said, Oh, that's a crap idea. And then you did it. So it yeah. doesn't worry me at all that you know some cynical people think it's crap. Yeah. Well, I've been it, around it, the it, country and testing this with people. And people are super enthusiastic about doing something that's within our collective agency because everyone knows the Labour Party is going nowhere, right? 
And even if it oh, was yeah. going to go yeah. somewhere, you wouldn't be able to influence it anyway. But it's yeah, run by a little chance. You know, dictatorship, yeah. isn't it? Well, ju just before I, we, we bring ads in for another question. So I'm, I'm working on a climate jury at the local authority that I work on. Yeah. Work for, and uh, not to be named. And I, uh, <laughs> it's like, there is kind of a feeling in a room when you basically tell people that like what you're doing in here, we really care about and it matters. And it's taken a couple of sessions for the, for the people in the room who are all, you know, that look like this, you know, it's based on census data, like the city and it's whatever. And they're kind of having to work out how to, I suppose, not think for themselves, but kind of have that agency to think that their opinions are important and as valid as the experts and folk that are coming to speak to them about climate change. It's like, it doesn't matter that this guy, you know, has a PhD and knows the science, your position in your life, you have a, you know, a quality to that and an opinion, which is also important yeah. because it's going to affect everyone. And it, 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 is taking like a couple of weeks for that to slowly kind of internalize in them. So I imagine any kind of assembly process that you, you kind of work on, it's going to be, like you say, a, a five, 10 year thing because there's so much of that self actualization to actually get underway. Um, to get yeah. To the space to yeah. Well, stuff. this is the, the, the genius of assemblies when they're done well, of course, right. You look out on people, you know, shouting each other, interrupting each other. Yeah. It's all about the miracle of listening without sounding too hippie you know it's like, the it's, like the but podcast, it's true mate. you know i mean i'm a <laughs> empirical social scientist you know yeah. if i thought it was bollocks i'd say so yeah. but i've researched it i've seen it when people sit down and they listen to each other and people who are never heard never listened to are heard for the first time mm -hmm. it's actually very emotional and so many mm -hmm. people feel so disempowered and this is why i think assemblies are going to be the next big thing is because we're just not being heard, you know, and that's what's, yeah. you know, pushing people over to the Reform Party, yeah. you know, pushing people into, you know, self-destructive behaviour, all the rest of it, right? It's because as human beings, we need attention. We need to be valued. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, you know, bad things happen to our psyches and, you know, it's, it's all around us, isn't it? Yeah. This miserable depressiveness. And then you go to an yeah. assembly and suddenly... It's like Mrs. Jones down the road is going, oh, I think like that as well. And you go, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you I'm not alone. You've mentioned you know? Mrs. Jones a few times. I've got to meet this yeah, woman. Yeah. She sounds Mrs. great. Mrs. Jones, it's like, it's like, um, it's like uh, whatever it's called, Walk, uh, Worcester Woman or something, isn't it? It's like, oh, right. <laughs> anyway, you know. What, what you, know what you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, most, yeah. most people, most of the time, want an okay life. They want things to be okay for their kids. They don't want to be treated like idiots, you know. Yeah. This these are the perennial needs of most people most of the time. Mm -hmm. And there's no movement, there's no voice for that agenda in this yeah. country. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. Yeah. Now, just one thing though, and I'm wondering, um, you did mention before that once we hit 1.5, it's not like it's the end of the world. Yeah, but it means that there's a series of potential tipping points and things are gonna get more disruptive. Now, the idea of a people's assembly has to have some sort of stability, civil stability for them to, to sort of work, yeah? And I'm yeah. just wondering, you know, on the current trajectory that we're on with, with climate change and, you know, uh, climate breakdown, you're talking like five, ten years for this movement to really sort of kick in and start to make moves, but we are really on the precipice now, aren't we, of the unknown where year on year, you know, civil society you know, and that stability that you sort of need, that foundational stability to create these sort of um, political structures, whether grassroots or not, um, the, the is becoming a bit more precarious, isn't it, year on year? And and I have noticed um, recently in, on your on your social media, you you do talk about revolution, um, and I'm wondering, is this the revolution you're talking about, or are you are you thinking if it's not this, yeah, if we don't get this into play, these people's assembly, then we really are now talking about a, a revolution in the traditional left sense. What, what I'm trying to say is there's massive social disruption coming anyway. It's not like you're still going to have a quiet life and, you know, fly off to Spain every summer, right? Those that, the, you know, the life we've had in this country for the last 30 years is coming to an end. And we're one way or another we're going into a time of massive 
social tension. Mm-hmm. And and that leads, the default of that is it leads to right-wing authoritarianism, right? And But it doesn't if we get organised. Basically, in a nutshell, that's my position. And getting right. organised means organising for a revolutionary change in society. And when I say, you know, I'm using this word revolution a lot, and I will be in the future, but I don't mean it in a rhetorical sense. I don't mean it in a romantic sense. I mean it in a sociological sense, in the mm-hmm. sense that a revolution is a, a, a frequent event in history. There's nothing unusual about revolutions, right? They happen every 70, 100 years when elites basically destroy themselves. And they can be good and they can be bad and they can be violent and they can be nonviolent and all the rest of them. But what, what it means is there's a change in the regime. And the change in the regime, i.e. the system of government, you know, it goes from autocracy to democracy. That's a revolution. So I, I'm not I'm not messing around here with some, you know, oh, I'm going to entertain all these people on this podcast by talking about revolution. I'm serious, right? I want to make revolution yeah. boring. You know, <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. We're revolutionaries. That's what we are. We're not campaigners. We're not protesters. We're revolutionaries. And we're serious. This is not a little thing you do when you're a student for a year before you go and off, you know, and get your banking job. It is a lifetime commitment, like it was in the early 20th century, right? And what revolution in the 21st century means, if it's going to be pro-social and if it's going to be non-violent, is assemblies leading to mass civil resistance, which leads to assembly-based governments. In other words, governments which are run by citizens selected by sortition, selected randomly. And no one's pretending, you know, it's going to be utopia, but it's going to be so much better than having the neoliberal situation or, you know, some popular right bollocks, right? That's turning everyone against each other. And we know where that leads, right? So there's a lot of work to be done, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, you know, I'm always a little bit ahead of my time, as you might say, you know. So a lot of people probably go, oh God, you know, revolution, that sounds, but, you talk to people in the street, you know, 50% of this country, if you have a two minute conversation with people, people go, yeah, let's have a revolution. And the only reason we're not having it is because there's not the leadership in the organization. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot to be done, right? I'm not pretending for a minute. And that's why I'm saying it's a five year project. But I think this is what the social movements need to say. And they need to be honest. The only way we're going to save our kids is by having revolutionary change. Mm. And I'm not even that keen on revolution, right? I think it's pretty messy. I'd love to just have a nice campaign job. But those days have gone. That's what I'm saying, Mm -hmm. right? And and we're going to have this big, massive period of of social, you know, disruption. And dare I say it, it is going to be exciting. And people will cheer up, you know, because people will will grasp their collective power. Mm -hmm. And that's an essential requirement for mental health. And one of the reasons they've yeah, been so agency, miserable yeah. now is because people don't feel they have agency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's pros and cons. You know, you know, I'm not I'm not naive. I think it's going to be really tricky. But don't give me this bollocks that, you know, oh, we're going to have revolution. This is going to be the worst thing in the world. You know, this sort of bourgeois notion that, you know, disruption is really bad. No, it's not. It's actually exciting as well. Right. <laughs> speaking of yeah. um, spe- speaking of, of the bourgeois, I apologize if if you think this question is a bit trite, but I'm kind of really interested. So I've, we've you know kind of preparing for this interview. I've watched a lot of you t- talking to other people in the media, and you know like um, the interview with Nick Robinson for for example. And I find that they don't seem to also mainstream journalists don't seem to understand at all where where you're coming from, or even try to really entertain the the, the position so, so much so like do you think in, in regards to this wider project that the media is still some kind of target we should be looking at as like leftist socialists or revolutionaries to be in and disrupting or should we abandon that as well and would, would the assembly kind of take over that role to some extent if you see what i'm saying like how, how do we get the messages well, out di- on a wider di- disruption has two quite different functions you know Disruption is a mechanism to get attention and build a movement. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some someone, dare I say, should go to supermarkets and take some food out and give it to people, right? The reason to do that is not because you're trying to give food away. It's to get attention 
and build a movement. Uh, you know, for, for people saying we're not going to put up with child hunger in this country. Yeah. So often that's what that's what direct action is there to do is mm -hmm. basically to build build movements. But obviously, direct action or mass civil resistance is actually in the end game of a revolution as well. You know, if you look at the Philippines or you know East Germany, Czechoslovakia, you know, whenever there's revolutions, Tahrir Square. It's all about people getting together. They go to the center of the city and they stay there. And that's what the end game looks like. So there's two quite yeah. different logics to using direct action, as you might say, depending yeah. upon upon the context. But it's let me make be totally clear, because you know, there's an article in the Times today about me or something. And it's going, oh, Roger Allen's decided, you know, we should all do door knocking. It's like, no, what I'm trying to say is we need to fuse together all the different elements. And that's really difficult for people that have juxtaposed it for the last 30 years. You know, oh, mm -hmm. you do politics. Oh, you do campaigning. Oh, you sit in the road. It's like, no, we need to do all of these. And all the people involved in the different areas need to know that they need people in the other areas. Right, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, and yeah. that's what you might call a mature political project, radical political project. Where it's not either or, it's both and, if, yeah. if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so all, that's... All positions at all times to see what works, I guess. Yeah, within this non-violent framework, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no point people going off and becoming terrorists, terrorist state, right? Just for the record. You know, what, 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 what the revolution, if it's going to be pro-social, has to be rooted in is ordinary people in their local communities organising themselves, but not being you know total autonomists as it were mm -hmm. but bringing themselves bringing those that local power into national power so it's a sophisticated strategy right it's yeah. not like hey we're going to have this national party and everyone else just has to go and do door knocking but nor are we saying oh there's going to be an assembly in manchester and they're going to do great stuff but don't ask them to do anything nationally right both of those are really dumb strategies yeah the strategy has to be you're doing your assembly in Manchester, and then some of those people are going to go to the National Assembly. You know, it's not necessarily in London, mm -hmm. because you need to have a national consciousness. And this is what this is what effective social power is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at South America, you look at the traditional revolutions, they have a national leadership, they have a national structure, they have a national program. And that's what galvanizes people at a local level. So it's synergistic. It's not like you know, national versus local. The yeah. national creates the local, right? So like when we set up XR, when it became nationally well-known, we went from 50,000 to 200,000 in four months. All those 150,000 people didn't find out about it because some local person knocked on the door. They saw it on yeah. the telly. Yeah. And they thought, fuck, that's good. <laughs> you see what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So when you, yeah, yeah. you know, when you see 50 groups around the country taking foods out of supermarkets and give, giving it to poor families mm -hmm. it'll go on the national telly and then you'll have a thousand groups doing it right mm. so it's this that's that's you know that's what i sort of like try and try and organize uh is this is this sort of takeoff scenario as you might yeah. say yeah interesting mm. well roger as soon as you've been talking about revolution i'd like to end on something that you shared on social media a couple of weeks ago you put oh, no, only a, that? <laughs> it's only a revolution can bring us together. It's all going really well, and then you weren't going to give me some embarrassingly <laughs> tabloid question or something. Or that. No, no, I'm going to I'm going to end on a positive. Something you shared a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I think it was on X. It says only a revolution can bring us together. Only when we remember that we are all connected can we come together on the basis of the one human value on which we can all unite. That life is good. That we must preserve it at all costs, whatever it takes. Roger, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this evening really appreciate that and uh, hope we can speak again in the future yeah and thanks so much and good luck to all your listeners yeah keep good. going okay everyone this is a part of this show where we ask our guests if there's anybody you'd like to give a bit of shine to or thank you for any um any actions in the past roger who have you got for us this week well what i'd like people to do is to contact the humanity project that i'm connected with and they are doing national zoom calls every week or two to give people information about how they can hold local assemblies that will feed into a national assembly and then this house of the people I've been speaking to. There's lots of enthusiasm about it. We want to hold hundreds of assemblies. We've got There's about 70 to 100 being organised at the moment. It's a big thing. 
it's going to be the next big thing in my view and if you okay. want to hear about it you know then go on to this link and or look at the humanity project and go on the zoom call and find out what to do yeah we'll, def- yeah, we'll definitely add all the links to that, Roger. So thank you for that. And a big thank you to everyone that is listening. And remember, if you're helping the planet in any way at all, no matter how big or small, we love you, we appreciate you, and we hope you join us again next time. Take care, everyone.